Good evening, and let me welcome you to another presentation of the uh, Charles Hamilton Houston uh, Lecture Series. I'm Charles Ogletree, the founder and the director, and so delighted to have so many of you here uh, tonight uh, for this special fall uh, program. As with all of the programs sponsored by the Institute, they are free and open to the public, uh, and our programs are also a webcast. Uh, this is a very uh, special evening for us coming after the opening of the Institute in honor of one of Harvard's most distinguished graduates, Charles Hamilton Houston, it opened September 15th. Uh, and this is a continuation in our series on issues of race uh, and justice. Uh, and no trial uh, in the last century has generated as much national and international uh, coverage uh, as has the uh, trial of Michael Jackson uh, this uh, past year. Uh, and we are very pleased to have uh, people here to talk about that as well as uh, other important issues. Uh, those of you who are not on our uh, list uh, for our updates, we do circulate a sign-up sheet, and if you have an email address, uh, make sure you include it. Uh, after uh, you hear from the uh, speakers, uh, there will be uh, a, brief, a brief q and A session by me, and then you're welcome to come to the microphones in the middle of the. Uh, uh, room uh, to ask a question. Uh, this is an audience largely of law students and lawyers, and I know that law students and lawyers have difficulty asking questions rather than making statements, but today I hope you'll think very seriously before you go to the microphone and remember that there's a question at the end of your profound thought that you'd want to give us uh, today. Uh, we have three uh, distinguished speakers with us today. One is en route. Uh, our, uh, Special guest speaker is Tom Mesero, uh, who is uh, no stranger to this community. Uh, Mr. Mesero is actually a graduate uh, of Harvard College uh, before he went to Hastings uh, Law School uh, in California. Uh, and he has been a distinguished uh, member of the California Bar and has not only handled uh, significant cases, I'll talk about Michael Jackson in a moment, but he also was counsel for Robert Blake. Uh, and was the, the lawyer able to get uh, Mr. Blake out on bail uh, before uh, they both had a parting of the ways. Uh, he also uh, was quite helpful in making sure that uh, Robert Blake was not charged with uh, the death penalty, which was certainly a, a possibility in the state of California. Most people know him from his uh, flamboyant and uh, incredibly effective work in the Michael Jackson case, which generated uh, international attention. Much of it was on the defendant, Michael Jackson, but as people began to hone in on the evidence, it really focused on the lawyer, the amount of preparation, uh, the effort to keep the cameras out of the courtroom because of the fear that it might uh, prevent his client from getting a fair trial, challenging the government's seizure of thousands of pieces of evidence from Mr. Jackson's uh, home uh, before uh, the uh, trial, uh, the vigorous examination of every witness called uh, by the prosecution uh, during the, the case, uh, the willingness to stand up to the judge in some very heated arguments uh, to ensure that his client was effectively represented, uh, and uh, the very much uh, uh, amazing verdict of 14 acquittals uh, on every charge that Mr. Jackson faced uh, in this particular trial. That's the public Tom Mesereau that you may know. The private Tom Mesereau, in my view, is even more uh, significant uh, advocate of justice. Uh, every uh, year he goes down south of places like Mississippi uh, and works on uh, death penalty cases. Uh, he has been volunteering time in Southern uh, California, uh, working in the community there uh, uh, continuously. Uh, he has been uh, recognized and uh, acknowledged by the former Reverend Cecil Murray of First AME Church uh, in California, by Bishop Blakey uh, of the uh, West Angeles Church where Johnny Cochran was funeralized uh, in April of this year, uh, and many others. So he is someone who's well known in the community, not for what you read about in the press, but for what he does every single day for poor, uh, deprived, uh, uh, voiceless, and often, often powerless people in the, in the criminal justice system. Uh, and we're very pleased that despite his very crazy schedule, uh, he has uh, uh, flown here from California, walked to his uh, old uh, living quarters, Elliott House, uh, uh, in the yard. Uh, been on the Harvard Law School campus, walked through the Harvard Square, uh, and f uh, finds himself a Canterbridgean for the moment. You'll be hearing more from him in a short while, but please join me in welcoming Tom Mesereau. Uh, 
Uh, our second speaker, who will walk in the room probably in the middle of my introduction of him, uh, is also a well-known uh, uh, personality. Uh, Dan Abrams uh, is the host of the Abrams Report, a program that appears regularly on MSNBC. He's a commentator on every significant case uh, involving legal affairs. He's a graduate of uh, Duke University. Uh, he has been uh, involved intimately in every case from the uh, Scott Peterson uh, prosecution to the O.J. Simpson case to the uh, Michael Jackson case, and he's a person who calls it like it is. Uh, he's received numerous awards for his journalistic uh, reporting, uh, and he's also someone, um, in fact, he right now is taping his show that will air uh, tonight um, uh, here in Boston, and that's why he's running a little bit late, uh, but he's joined us uh, for the evening. Uh, and I'll say another word before I formally int introduce him, uh, Dan Abrams, who I'll come back to. And finally, I'm very delighted to have the Middlesex District Attorney. If the face uh, is familiar, it's because Martha Coakley has been in this community for a very uh, long time. Uh, she has uh, been a seasoned prosecutor uh, in this community, practicing in, in Lowell for a while. Uh, she also was the chief of the uh, Child Abuse uh, Protection uh, Unit. Uh, she also was one of the two counsels who represented uh, the Commonwealth in the prosecution uh, of Louise Woodward, the au pair, uh, here uh, several years ago, uh, where Ms. Woodward was convicted uh, of a homicide count uh, and was uh, sentenced by um, one of our local judges to a, uh, a uh, term served and was released and now has returned to England and become a member of the bar, I believe, has become a lawyer there. Uh, she has uh, been very active uh, in many community organizations uh, here uh, in the area uh, and as well uh, regarded by the prosecutors. She also is a candidate for the Attorney General, uh, which will uh, be elected for Massachusetts uh, in November of 2006. Uh, she did her undergraduate uh, work at Williams College. Uh, she did her law, law work at Boston University. Uh, and her husband, uh, Thomas uh, F. O'Connor, Jr., is a former detective in the Cambridge uh, Police uh, Department. We're very pleased to have here uh, tonight as well uh, Middlesex District Attorney uh, Martha Coakley. <clears throat> In addition to things I've already said about uh, Tom Mesero, who's going to talk a little bit about you know, his role in, in the Michael Jackson case and the role of lawyers, uh, what is interesting is that we're going to move through this program rather quickly because one of the sort of unsung heroes uh, that he is is that tonight, uh, and you'll have time to watch it, uh, Barbara Walters has selected the 10 most fascinating people uh, in America, uh, and one of those people that she selected is Tom Mesereau, uh, who will be on the interview tonight. Uh, I think it's Channel 5 here uh, at 10 uh, p.m., so you'll be able to, to uh, uh, see another side uh, of Tom Mesereau. And Channel 7 is covering it. Somewhere Dan Housley's floating around the room, so you'll see a, oh, there's Dan, a, a story as well uh, on Channel uh, 7 uh, about uh, our distinguished visitor. So I'm just very pleased to, to have someone who uh, was involved in a very important case, a very tough case. Uh, the Simpson case was the case of the 20th century in terms of publicity, and the Jackson case clearly was the case of the 21st century with more international coverage and more actual coverage than any other case in the history uh, of, of cases that have been uh, covered thus far. Uh, and what we saw throughout was a very much under control, measured, confident, uh, and when the few lawyers who said over and over, not that his client is not guilty, my client is innocent, a very important and bold statement that he made over and over again. We're so pleased to have him here at the Charles Hammond Houston Institute for Race and Justice Lecture Series. Please join, as he comes to the podium, Tom Mesereau. Well, thank you very much. I'm very honored and privileged to be invited to speak to the law school. I want to thank Professor Ogletree and the Institute and the law school and everyone associated with it. I'm really, really touched to be here and, and I've been really looking forward to it. The Institute, as I understand it, deals with issues of race and justice. So I'd like to begin by talking about how those two factors played into the Michael Jackson case and what they mean for defense lawyers in general. There are two things I think a defense lawyer has to do when it comes to race in a criminal case. Number one, 
what is the significance of race, if any, in a case? And number two, what do you do with it? And there are situations where you might decide there clearly is an issue of racial injustice, racism, bigotry, favoritism, whatever it is, based on skin color or ethnicity, or it could be religion, whatever it is. And if you identify that problem as a real problem in the case, the next question is to properly defend your client and secure your client's freedom. What do you do with it? Do you raise it at all? Do you raise it before a trial? Do you raise it during the trial? What do you do with it, practically speaking, to save your client? Because saving your client is the number one responsibility you have, in my opinion. Now, if you look at American history, particularly the history of our justice system and how race plays a role in it, there have been cases where the defense lawyer, in conjunction with the client, decided that the case was a primarily political case where the number one goal was to raise and expose racism, to raise and expose bigotry. And if that's something the lawyer and the client decided to do, that's something that might be the primary objective. But what I'm talking about is where the primary objective is your client's freedom, your client's reputation, and saving your client's life. And I'm going to briefly mention three cases where there was a potential racial component and how I handled it differently in each. In the early 90s, I agreed to defend a case pro bono in federal court in Los Angeles. It was United States of America versus Patricia Moore. Patricia Moore was an African-American woman from Compton, California, who was on the Compton City Council. And she had become quite controversial in Los Angeles for being very, very vocal about her views on race, particularly racism directed at blacks by whites. And in the aftermath of the Rodney King problems in Los Angeles, which I think many of you know about, there was another incident in South Los Angeles where an African-American girl went to a liquor store and got into an argument with a Korean-American owner, and she was shot to death, uh, shot in the back of the head. It was, her name was Latasha Harlins. The owner of the store was prosecuted. Um, she had an African-American lawyer, a very prominent one, defending her. Uh, she was convicted and got probation, and the black community in L.A. was absolutely outraged at the lenient sentence and felt that uh, had the victim not been African-American, the sentence would have been far harsher. And Patricia Moore uh, was very vocal about her feelings about that. Unfortunately, she became a target of an FBI investigation into corruption in the city of Compton. And the FBI set up a very complex and intricate sting operation, and they had a developer um, who was posing as someone who could bring tremendous economic benefits to this community. It was all a fake. It was all a fabrication, and he was approaching various members of the city council and other prominent members in Compton about developing a waste-to-energy plant which would bring Compton jobs, uh, a larger tax base, uh, revenues, uh, all sorts of other advantages. They talked about setting up a daycare center. They talked about job training for students. They talked about uh, helping the, the elderly uh, with opportunities at the plant. It was going to be something that would take this very poor community economically and put it on the map. It was, all a, it was all a fake. It was just a sting operation. And they were taping people for three to four years uh, in the community, everyone from ministers to politicians to business people. Um, and unfortunately, Ms. Moore at one point was taped for a year taking money she should not have been taking. Now, to most people in my profession, to most people in the public, this was a case no lawyer would ever want, and how would you ever, why would you ever take the case free? And there was a lot more to the case than those tapes which appeared to incriminate her suggested. They had worked for a year to try and get Patricia Moore to incriminate herself. They had taken a fellow from Las Vegas, an African-American male, who was trying to gain favors with the government, who had a conviction, and they arranged for him to essentially become her boyfriend. And he approached her at her office with flowers 
and he told her that he was president of a business development company that could give her a tremendous career boost, and he became her campaign manager in her political campaign. They went to Mexico on a number of occasions, uh, occasions when the FBI, who was taping everything he did and said on a daily basis, decided to conveniently not tape during those trips. And essentially, they decided they were going to do whatever it took to put her in a compromising position. And even that witness who they tried to hide outside of the state, who I had the judge order in as our witness, admitted that it took about a year to get her to start taking money. But unfortunately, she did take it, and she took it for approximately a year, and she made statements that were rather incriminating, and she was convicted of some counts and not others. But then, the question, why take the case? I took the case because I thought what the government had done was absolutely outrageous. And I felt they had never done this in any other predominantly white community that I ever heard of. I took the position they would only would do this in a poor African-American community. I took the position that they thought they could get away with things because they had devalued the people in that community based upon race. I raised an entrapment defense. I also made a motion to dismiss the case based on selective prosecution because of her race. Now, in the middle of this investigation, and there must have been over 600 surveillance tapes in the case, I had about 50 boxes of documents, I found one tape, I'll never forget it, late one evening in my office, a Saturday night, I'm bleary-eyed from just sick of listening to tapes. I mean, I listened really to, to all 600 of them, most of them audio tapes. I found one that didn't seem, seem rather strange. Um, I figured out, finally, that the two FBI agents, both of whom were white, and the chief government foreman, who was Armenian, did not know the tape recorder was on. And they were waiting for my client to show up for her first payment. And it was just a remarkable tape, because it was so different from any other tape I had heard. And at one point, the Armenian informant said to the two white FBI agents, you know, this is a crazy case. They're greedy. Every black one's coming from everywhere. We'll put she and the mayor, who was black, on ice, and then we'll get another one. That's on the tape. Now, was that tape enough to exonerate Ms. Moore in front of this federal court jury? It was not. But it was certainly enough to expose racism in a government investigation, racism in the way they prosecuted the case, and it was enough to really send an embarrassing message to the government, if you try this kind of stuff, you're going to be exposed for what you are. Okay? So she was convicted of some counts. She got a very minimal sentence. I'm convinced it had a lot to do with what we exposed in the case. We also found a letter written to the head of the FBI by the informant that essentially was complaining about blacks getting away with things in Compton. Uh, and essentially was, for, from my point of view, had a clearly racist message in the case, in the, in, as far as he was concerned and had a race, formed a racist motive for what he was doing in Compton as he tried to help the government take down black politicians, okay? There's a case where I found evidence of racism and I screamed from A to Z about the government's racism in the case. I felt it really was something we had to raise and I felt it was something that had to be exposed. Now, a couple of years later, I handled a high-profile criminal case in Los Angeles. It was not pro bono. I represented a fellow named Larry Carroll, who was a prominent newscaster, had been for about 30 years in Los Angeles. He's African-American. He and two other African-American men were indicted by a state grand jury in San Bernardino, California, which is outside of Los Angeles County, for securities fraud. And basically, some scams had been put together. They were quite complex and they were fraudulent. And the prosecutor, who was white, decided to only charge the three African-American men who I discovered after my investigation were really victims of the scam and not perpetrators. In fact, my client had put his own money into the investment, and there was evidence that he was told he had a big return coming, and commissions were promised to the three African-American men who were charged. If you listen to the tapes, the investigatory tapes, it was clear that the people who put these scams together were white. It was clear that white men had conceived of the entire way of presenting these scams so that almost anybody, you know, on surface at least, who didn't know much about it could be taken. 
I discovered there had been a meeting of the International Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong the year before where bankers and representatives of sophisticated financial institutions around the world had got together to talk about this problem, these types of frauds proliferating around the world and scamming banks. So the question at that point was why are three black guys charged and why are the white guys who put them together not charged, okay? So there was clearly a racial issue in the case. I chose not to raise it at all. I actually had some meetings in South Los Angeles uh, with some black activists who wanted to bring busloads of people to R Rancho Cucamonga, which is in Santa Br San Bernardino County where the trial took place, and I said don't. I said I'm familiar with the jury pool. It's going to be predominantly white. I don't want to do anything that I think might hurt our defense. We're going to win this case without raising a racial issue even though it's there. And after an 11 week trial, the judge, who was the presiding judge in that courthouse, said he was going to do something he had never done in his career. He was not going to let it get to the jury. He was going to dismiss it in the interest of justice. And he did. So there's an example where there's clear evidence of racism, but you don't raise it because your primary goal is save your client's life. Now the Michael Jackson case. If you listen to the media in the Michael Jackson case, you would say to yourself that this community where the case was tried, Santa Maria, in the city of Santa Maria in Santa Barbara County, California, which is north of Los Angeles, it's between Los Angeles and San Francisco. If you listen to the media, you would have to conclude that this jury was composed of white rednecks who were ready to string up Michael Jackson without a trial. That's what you'd have to conclude. And it was absolutely false. It was absolutely false. This is a community where Michael Jackson chose to live. There were very few African Americans in the community. It was primarily white and Latino. And it's known to be a very conservative community. White collar, conservative, but also with a strong libertarian streak. And even the prosecution before the trial began made a motion in limine that we not be allowed to refer to them as the government in our defense. And that was denied, and as you can imagine, I periodically pointed at the government prosecutors in my defense. Well, I got up there early, and I had never tried a case in San Bernardino County. And I'd put my jeans on and just hang out in some bars and restaurants, nothing fancy, usually by myself, to see what happened. And invariably, somebody would figure out who I was because it was a big case in that community and they would start talking to me. And what I discovered, at least in terms of my limited, you know, experiences of that sort, which were usually mid-afternoon, early evening, was that Michael Jackson was extremely popular in that community. White people, Latino people, young, middle-aged, old children loved Michael. He was their celebrity. He could have lived anywhere in the world he had chosen their community. He had done kind things for people in that community. When the Air Force wanted to use Neverland to do a film, he said, come on in. He had waiting lists of kids, primarily disadvantaged kids, who wanted to come to Neverland for a day with the amusement park and with the zoo. And even though not everybody liked him, a lot of people did. Now, I had a jury consultant, and she did what jury consultants always do and that is they conduct surveys and focus groups and they obtain data and they correlate data. They'll get your age and your occupation and your political affiliation, your religion, your race, and they will associate it with various attitudinal issues and they'll come up with a typical profile of what a pro-prosecution juror would be and what a pro-defense juror would be. And had I listened to that data, which the prosecution had as well, probably wouldn't have done as well. Because, among other things, that data said that women with kids are probably your worst jurors. It's a child molestation case. Mothers are, want to protect their children, and this is the worst kind of thing you can do. And frankly, women with kids were what I wanted. Because jury surveys, hard data, this kind of analysis is no substitute for your intuition, for your feelings about people, for your understanding about who your client is and who might be open to understanding your client, 
for your intuitions and your instincts about who might look at the prosecution witnesses and see through them if you really think you represent the truth, and I am convinced we did. And I said to myself, race is not going to be an issue in this case. Now, Michael and his family were concerned about no African Americans on the jury. We had one African American alternate who never made it to the actual panel. I was not concerned. The more I learned about the community, the more I learned about my case, the more I learned about the client, the more I sensed what I thought about this courthouse and what had happened in the past in this courthouse, the more I really thought we're going to get a fair shake. And I'll tell you something else. I learned, as I said before, I'd never tried a case in Santa Barbara County, but I learned that there's somewhat of an attitudinal split between the North County and the South County. As I said before, Santa Maria is in the North County, which is primarily blue collar, working class, very conservative. The South County, thought to be more affluent and more liberal. You have the University of California at Santa Barbara in the South. You have the district attorney's principal office in the South. There had been two bills I discovered introduced in the state legislature trying to get the North to secede from the South. And I said to myself, you know, this is Michael's community. He chose it. People like him. Let's position Michael and his community against this vindictive DA from the South. And I think it was effective because I also learned that most people in that community thought the DA was on a vendetta to get Michael Jackson. He had convened a grand jury in the early 90s to try and get an indictment and he had failed. The grand jury met for approximately six months and would not charge Michael Jackson with anything. And I have since spoken to someone who was on that grand jury quite recently from Los Angeles. She was on a Los Angeles grand jury that was convened at the same time, and they had real problems with these accusations, and real problems with a sense that people were trying to get money out of Michael Jackson by generating these charges. So he failed to get an indictment in the early 90s. In the mid-90s, the district attorney flew to Australia and Canada. They're the only countries I know that he went to. He may have gone to others, looking for victims of Michael Jackson. He failed. They told him to get lost. He didn't do anything to us. He had a website at the sheriff's department looking for information on Michael Jackson and finally got the case that you know about because it was tried this year. And as Professor Ogletree said, 10 felony counts, not guilty, four lesser included misdemeanor counts, not guilty. Didn't even hang him on misdemeanors. The case, in my opinion, was a total fraud. It was an effort by unscrupulous prosecutors and police to do anything they could and say anything they could say to try and get a conviction on a single count. And it was absolutely unjust what was done to Michael Jackson this year. But my conclusion on the issue of race, I told people who I had the ability to talk to about the issue the following. I said to African American people, Michael Jackson is black. He is black. If you ask him what his race is, he's black. But you know, to a lot of white people, Michael Jackson transcends race. He brings people together. We played tapes to the jury where he talked about why he loves people on all continents, people of all races. He said at one point, I wish I could adopt a child from every continent. He talked about how he dislikes racism and dislikes bigotry. And I am absolutely convinced that that jury saw Michael Jackson as someone who brings people together, not apart. And I never had a concern about these jurors being fair. I just didn't. I always thought this jury would never ally with the DA because it was their county. I never thought so. I never thought this jury would penalize Michael Jackson because he has long care, because he has a serious skin condition which I have witnessed. It's called vitiligo. He has shown me his skin. If you look at the, his back, you will see brown patches and white patches. It's changing and eating pigment in his skin. He's very embarrassed with that. He chose to put white makeup on his face rather than have these splotches all over his face. That's his choice. I don't think it's a crime to do that. And the media kept portraying him as so weird and so strange, and I would say to people, turn on the TV any night and look at people who are stranger than Michael Jackson. He is creative. He dances to his own drummer. On a tape we played to the jury, he said, you know, you like to go to ball games. I like to sit in my tree and make music. Yes, he's different. Yes, he's a musical genius. Yes, he's had his problems. 
yes, he's a human being, and no, he's not a criminal. So these are three examples where you had to first identify whether there was a racial component and do it honestly, and then you had to say to yourself as a defense attorney, what do I do with it? And you can't listen to everybody else, and you can't listen to the media, and you can't listen to the scandal mongers. You've got to figure out for yourself, based on the facts, the evidence, what you know about your client and the witnesses, what you think is going on. Now, I didn't raise a racial issue. I didn't think he was prosecuted because of his race. I thought he was prosecuted because he was a mega celebrity. I will say this. The last witness I called was actor-comedian Chris Tucker. And Chris Tucker testified that this family who was accusing Michael Jackson had tried to hustle him. They wanted his car. They told him the child had cancer, like Michael Jackson was told. He invited them to a day in Las Vegas where they were shooting, filming the, the film Rush Hour One. They stayed three weeks and billed him for everything. They kept asking him for money, and he flew to Miami, and he met Michael Jackson at a hotel, and he said, be careful, something is wrong. He warned Michael Jackson about this accuser and his family. On cross-examination, the district attorney, Tom Snedden, conducted the cross. And at one point, he showed Chris Tucker a blow-up of a photograph of Chris with the accuser and his family at a wedding. And Chris rather humorously said, I like that picture, you know where I can get it. And everybody kind of chuckled in the courtroom. The DA looked at him and said, I'll get it for you if you're a good boy. Now, the African American community, as far as I can tell, and I was not watching the media all the time, I was working most of the time, I would take a break and channel surf to see what I could see, didn't pick up on this very much. And I was happy because I, again, Coming back to my defense, my belief in what would work, I didn't want to raise issues of racism in this case. I looked at this jury, I felt this jury, I didn't think it would help us. And I had to take a very difficult and controversial position at the end of the case because of my belief in what was necessary to save my client, Michael Jackson. The day the jury got the case, I felt very good. I felt our case had gone in very well. And I had told certain people, I don't want a racial issue here. I don't want to be identified with a racial issue in this community. I don't think it's going to help us. At the beginning of the case, when I was asked by various people associated with Michael Jackson how I thought things were going, I had been very concerned. And let me sort of explain that this way. In November of 2003, Neverland was raided by 70 sheriffs. And I was called. I was driving back from Big Sur, California, to Los Angeles. I had taken a vacation. I was asked if I would fly to Las Vegas to meet Michael Jackson, that he wanted me to represent him. And I thought about it long and hard, and I declined because I was getting ready to defend actor Robert Blake in his homicide case, which was set for trial in February of 2004. And I didn't think I could do justice to both cases. Uh, I thought it would just drive both clients crazy if I was not available when they needed me. And Michael's people were quite surprised that I would, anybody would say no, but I did. When Blake and I had a falling out approximately 10 days before the start of his trial in February, and I withdrew, I uh, got a call about a month and a half later by Randy Jackson, Michael's brother, who's been a friend of mine for many years. <laughs> would I reconsider? Would I fly to Florida and meet him? I said I would. I went down and met Michael, uh, flew back, was asked in a short you know, five or six days later, will I come back? I said I would, and I was retained. But what I had seen uh, before I was retained on TV was of great concern to me. You may recall that first arraignment. I was not his lawyer then. First of all, Nation of Islam were providing security for Michael, and they were very prominent in Santa Maria at that first arraignment. Now, I've worked with Nation of Islam for many years, and I still do, and I've agreed to defend their Western regional leader if he is charged with assaulting a police officer, which they're threatening to do but haven't done yet. And 
I am well aware of what Nation of Islam does in the inner city in Los Angeles, the way they fight gang violence, the way they fight drugs, the way they try and teach people responsibility and spirituality, and they do so much in a city which is the gang capital of America to try and stop this violence. And I had worked with the Nation of Islam in the Patricia Moore case. They have been great supporters of her. But nevertheless, I did not think having a Nation of Islam in that prominent position uh, as Michael's security people in Santa Maria were helping him defend. I felt it was separating him more from the community that was going to judge him rather than making him part of the community that he had chosen to live in that would judge him. And I made that very clear. This is not a good way to start. I also had seen his lawyers and advisors in a meeting at the Beverly Hills Hotel, a very posh hotel in Los Angeles. They had a meeting and it was all over the news how all these fat cats who advised Michael Jackson were you know, at this hotel assembled to put together a defense. And they used the word dream team. And I said to myself as I watched the news, this is wrong. This is not helping Michael in this community. It's separating Michael from this community. Emphasize that he's one of the people around this courthouse. Don't emphasize that he's separate or bigger or, or, or completely different from those people because he's not. And I voiced my feelings about that. Um, I looked at it purely in terms of what would help him. Not in terms of necessarily what would create a political statement or the appropriate moral statement. I looked at it in terms of how do I save the life of Michael Jackson. And you may recall, if you followed the case, that during the second arraignment, after he was indicted, when I was his lawyer, you didn't see Nation of Islam prominent. You had certainly some Muslim security, but it wasn't a prominent thing. And there were no more parties in Neverland and no more summits, summit meetings in Beverly Hills and things of that sort. It wasn't going to help defend Michael. But at the end of the case, and unfortunately this got some TV coverage, and I'll just be perfectly honest about it, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who I have a lot of respect for, particularly what he did during the Civil Rights Movement and what he's done since, did appear. And I was upset. And I issued a press release that nobody's speaking for Michael Jackson or the family, that there's a gag order, we will honor it. And I had a talk with the Reverend Jackson, and I explained to him just what I'm explaining to you. There's no upside here to a lot of white people when they see you they think there's a racial divide or there's a racial issue that you're coming to expose and to fight against, as you should, but it's not going to help me with my job right now. And he did leave. Uh, he was there for a couple of days. Uh, he understood my goals. He understood my motives. I still have great respect for him, but I didn't want him there at that time for the reasons I've told you about. Now, I was asked if... Uh, if I wanted Al Sharpton to come up to the community. And I suggested that wouldn't be a good idea either, and he completely understood. He didn't think he belonged there either. Um, but you know, it's up to the defense attorney to identify these issues for what they are. See them realistically. Don't hide from what they are. And don't pretend our society is something it's not, and don't pretend the community where you're trying the case is something it's not. Be aware of what it is and adjust your defense accordingly. And that was what I was trying to do. Fortunately, we succeeded. And I absolutely believe justice was done. I know we have a lot of students here who are studying trial tactics. Uh, let me say a couple of things about trial tactics because I did pursue some unorthodox trial tactics in the case for which I was criticized until the verdicts. Um, and I'll just summarize them very, very quickly. A trial is a exercise in people. If you don't understand people, you're not as equipped to try a case as you could be. You don't learn about people in law school. You really don't. In fact, you learn in law school, in my opinion, that everything is an intellectual exercise. And it's not. I think the best trial lawyers understand what happens in their heart and their soul as much as what happens in their intellect. And if they're going to communicate with people who didn't go to law school and didn't go to college and come from different walks of life, some highly educated, some not, whoever they may be, you have to learn that there's a lot more to human nature than your intellect. And you have to learn what makes people tick. You have to learn who 
is the kind of person that typically resonates with you as the trial lawyer. You only learn that with experience. And you have to learn about people's intuitions, their instincts, their feel. Everything is not intellectual, trust me. And I really think that law schools do a disservice when they don't train trial lawyers to be good people. I often talk about the value of pro bono work because I thoroughly believe in it and I do it. And a lot of law students look at me like, what is he talking about? I'm in debt, I'm struggling, I can't pay the rent, I want a new car, this big job has been offered to me, are you nuts? You know. And I can't tell anybody how to live their life, only you can figure out what works for you. And we can't do everything in our short lives, we have to balance things out as best we can. But I will say this, ever since I was in law school, every study I've shown about lawyer satisfaction is alarming. Every study I've, shown, I've, I've seen indicates that the vast majority of lawyers are not happy in their work. And they seem to accept that as unchangeable. And what I've observed is, is, is very much the following. I see lawyers, particularly smart ones from good schools with good academic backgrounds, take very prestigious jobs. And after the allure sort of rubs off, um, they're unhappy and they move to another prestigious job. And then they move to another prestigious job. And it never dawns on them they're changing jobs without changing them at all. And many of them just eventually settle for making a tremendous amount of money in a prestige institution and they're not terribly satisfied. There'll be, there'll be some other adjustments more, more radical than that. You'll see lawyers go to the U.S. Attorney's Office where everybody has a pretty much of an elitist kind of attitude about what they're doing and then they'll jump from a prestige firm to the U.S. Attorney's Office and then back to a prestige firm and then you'll get them you know, in a bar one night having a third or fourth drink and they'll say, I don't like what I do, you know, but they're not going to change it. They're on a treadmill. Well, you know, there's a lawyer who uh, passed away 10 years ago named William Kunstler, and he wrote a wonderful book called My Life as a Radical Lawyer, which he published a year before his death in 1994. And I would urge everyone to read it. It's a fascinating book. Now, you know, he liked to embellish, you know, uh, the myth of who Bill Kunstler was, and he was known to exaggerate a little bit, as the co-author says in her introduction. But nevertheless, he's a guy who did everything right, quote unquote. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Yale, majored in French, later taught at Yale. He had a distinguished World War II record. He went to Columbia Law School. He formed a firm with his brother in downtown Manhattan. He bought a nice home in Westchester and he was doing everything right, except that none of it felt very satisfying to him. And someone from the ACLU called him one day and said, we have a civil rights case in the Deep South. Could you help us out with it? and he said he would and he began to work with Martin Luther King Jr. in the South and he just became enmeshed in the civil rights movement in the South. He became nationally famous in the Chicago 7 trial in the late 60s which had to do with whether or not the defendants incited a riot out in front of the Democratic National Convention in 68. He decided to devote his career to defending pariahs, people who nobody else would touch he almost relished in the idea of defending people that seemed defenseless. At the end of his life, he began to focus his attention more on Arab Americans who he thought in light of the 1993 bombing in New York um, uh, were now becoming the real target class for racism and injustice and bigotry. And by all accounts, he lived a very, very exciting, colorful, satisfying life as a lawyer. A couple of years after he died, a law professor in Alabama wrote a book called William Kunstler, The Most Hated Lawyer in America. And he analyzed his life from his perspective and really came to the conclusion that this was a satisfied lawyer. This was a lawyer who felt he had made a difference, who had affected society, who had found satisfaction in his work, who felt he had taken his law degree and really done something meaningful, had made the justice system work where it wouldn't have worked at all. I was talking to Professor Ogletree earlier today about a famous trial lawyer from Chicago who lived much earlier than William Kunstler named Clarence Darrow, who many of you may have heard about. Well, Clarence Darrow at one point in his career was doing everything right. He was corporation counsel for the city of Chicago, which at the time was thought to be a great springboard to fame and fortune. 
He was general counsel of a railroad in Illinois, which was also portrayed to be the same. It just wasn't enough. And he began to represent labor unions at a time when people associated with labor unions were considered criminals. They were considered to be criminal organizations, much like the mafia at a later time. He found great satisfaction doing pro bono work. He made a tremendous impact on society and by all accounts was a very, very stimulated, fulfilled lawyer. Doing all the right things doesn't always make you happy and fulfilled. It might for a while, and maybe it will your whole life, and if it does, do it with relish. But if it doesn't, don't be afraid to try and do something else. Am I running out of time? Okay. Um, I can talk for hours about all this because, in, in fact, I chose a life like this. Uh, I had to finally conclude at one point that I'm basically a misfit and a rene renegade, and I don't fit into these great places that everybody gravitates to, and I tried them, and it just didn't work for me. And I love pro bono work. I just love making an impact. You acquit someone in a homicide case who never would have a chance, who is innocent, who has no resources. There's no better feeling when you see what it's done to that person and their family. And even if you represent someone that looks guilty, to make the system work and make these arrogant prosecutors not abuse the law, not abuse the facts, and not take advantage of people who appear, appear defenseless is a wonderful feeling. And I'm not saying all prosecutors are like that. We obviously have one of our finest here, but some are, some are, okay? And police abuse their responsibilities and their power too, and exposing them and making this system the best system in the world is a very satisfying thing to do. Finally, on trial tactics, we are taught traditions as trial lawyers. They are passed on from generation to generation. And most trial lawyers don't have either the time or the interest to put them under a microscope and say to themselves, is this going to work in this case? They simply do what they were taught to do. And I'll give you an example. In my opening statement in the Michael Jackson case, I did something that is heresy to so many criminal defense lawyers. And that is that, as we all know, there's a presumption of innocence in a case. The prosecution has the burden of proving a case beyond a reasonable doubt. And the defense doesn't have the burden of proving anything. OK, that all sounds delightful. What does it mean in a courtroom? Well, here's what I think it means. And here's what I thought it meant in the Jackson case. First of all, I think jurors think the lawyers know what the truth is, whether we do or not. Second of all, they want to know what the truth is. And I believe when a defense attorney gets up in an opening statement and looks at the jury and says, my client is presumed innocent, they have the burden of proof, you'll have reasonable doubt at the end of this case, I think the typical jury looks at that defense attorney and says his client's guilty, he just thinks he can stop them from proving it. That's what I believe. Walking into the Jackson trial, I fervently believe we had the truth on our side, we had the evidence on our side, and we were in the right. And I saw no reason not to flaunt that. I saw no reason not to hit the prosecutors over the head with it. And I got up in my opening statement, and I said, I'm going to make promises to you. I'm going to make contracts with you. I'm going to prove this man's innocent. I never mentioned the burden of proof. I never mentioned reasonable doubt. I had a reason not to do that. And that is that I wanted to be the bearer of truth, not them. I did not want to look like someone who was playing with technicalities. Let them look like it. And I felt we got the momentum right in our opening statement. I felt we never let up. And I think that's why he was exonerated to the extent he was. You're taught cross-examination in law school. You're taught don't ask open-ended questions. Don't ask a cow question. Don't ask a why question. You're inviting an avalanche of horribles if you do that. Well, I think you need to start off by following that principle. But if you follow that principle your whole career, you will never be a great cross-examiner. Because you can't be a great cross-examiner unless at some point you start taking those risks and taking those chances. You just have to reach a point where your instincts tell you, this is where I can do it, and this is where I can't. Following the Robert Blake preliminary hearing, which was televised for three weeks, some court TV reporters told me, they said, uh, we haven't seen anyone ask so many open-ended questions as you but you always seem to make it work in your direction. And it's something I had to work at for a long time because I was taught exactly what you're being taught. Now, you can't be afraid of your case, especially 
if you have the truth with you. Don't be afraid of your case. Don't walk on eggshells like so many defense attorneys do. Many people said I should have rested when the prosecution rested in the Michael Jackson case because our cross-examination had been so effective. And I'll tell you, if I had rested, I think we would have at least gotten a hang. I don't think we necessarily would have gotten a not guilty. And I felt that if we got a hang, it would have made me famous because everybody thought you can't win the case. They'd say he's very good. He hung the jury in this big case, just like Leslie Abramson did in the first Menendez trial. Would have been probably great for me. What would it have done to my client? First of all, the prosecutors would have retried the case and corrected a lot of the mistakes they made. The judge may have changed some rulings that I thought I could use to our advantage. I didn't think Michael Jackson's life would be saved by resting when they rested. Now, when you put on your own case, you run risks because your witnesses are now subject to cross-examination. But again, I felt we had the truth. I felt we had the evidence. So I did not rest. We put it on our own, excuse me, we put on 50 witnesses. They had put on 90, and we got the result we got. Anything you're taught at some point has to be put under a microscope, okay? And you're taught, I remember in law school, I still can't believe this. I still can't believe anybody was teaching me this stuff. They would say, just make your points and sum them up at the end. That is insanity. People are always making up their mind, and they make up their mind quickly. And many human beings are stubborn. They cling to whatever conclusions they have reached. You've got to be selling your message from day one, and you've got to do it powerfully. Your questions have to tell your story. You can't just wait to tie it all together at the end. And don't assume jurors are thinking what you're thinking. You've got to really, really hit them over the head with your message. And essentially, you've got to give an opening statement in your opening statement, in your cross-examination, in your direct examination, and in your closing. There are four times to tell your story. Don't think cross-examination is just there to discredit a witness. It's there to tell your story. And how you discredit a witness depends very much on what you think of that witness. Because there are some witnesses that you have the feeling they're great actors, they're sociopaths, they're psychopaths, whatever they are, but you know that the longer they're up there, the more they're going to expose themselves. And they might expose themselves in a split second, but they will do it. And sometimes it helps you to have a witness on for days. Now, I was criticized for over-trying my case. One night I was channel surfing, and here's somebody, frankly, I think it was in Boston, saying he's over-trying his case. Guy never set foot in a courtroom or saw anything, but there I was over-trying my case. Well, I assume what this person meant was, why would he have a witness on this long? Because there were witnesses that the prosecution was relying on who I truly concluded, the longer they're up, the worse it's going to be. Even if you're talking about small stuff, stuff that doesn't seem consequential. That's not the point. The point is let the jury look into their heart and soul, let them see who this person is, and let them see what a liar and a fraud they are. Keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Finally, the media. I've been attacking the media ever since the verdicts. There is no one I respect more than a professional journalist who follows a code of ethics, who has professional values, this is the kind of journalist who, when they're reporting on what, it hap what is happening in a courtroom, never gives you the impression they have a stake in the outcome. If they report on a verdict, you never know what they really think personally because they're professionals. We had them in this case. We had Linda Deutsch from Associated Press. We had Mike Taibbi from NBC. These are professionals. Don Hobbs from the Santa Barbara News Press. We also had a bunch of clowns, okay? I call them tabloid reporters. I don't call them journalists. You shouldn't dignify them with that title. People from court TV, people from some of the cable stations, people who were screaming and yelling when they never set foot in the courtroom, trying to make you think they knew what was going on, former prosecutors and defense attorneys in New York who never set foot in the courtroom were passionately telling you about the significance or insignificance of a witness or a piece of evidence just to be seen on camera. And the reporting was dreadful, by and large, dreadful. Keep this in mind. The media's priorities are completely different from the priorities of those who participate in a trial. They are not under oath. They have no responsibility for what happens to the defendant or if there's a victim, the victim, or the people in the family of the victim or the family of the defendant. They are never going to blame themselves for whatever the outcome is. 
There are very few court orders they have to follow. There may be orders that they can sit in a certain place or park in a certain place, but that's about it. And the only thing they care about are ratings and money. It could be the most boring day ever in a courtroom, and you'll turn on the TV and they'll talk about how dramatic and exciting it was that day. Because they're trying to capture their audience, they want to continue to capture their audience, it's all business. And usually when they predict the outcome in a high profile case, they are wrong. In Menendez 1, they said it would be guilty, it was hung. In O.J. Simpson, they said it would be guilty, it was an acquittal. In Robert Blake, they said it would be guilty, and it was an acquittal. In Scott Peterson, they said it would be not guilty or a hung, it was guilty and a death verdict. And in Michael Jackson, the overwhelming consensus in the media was it will be a conviction, and it was 14 not guilties. The cases are one in the courtroom. They're not one outside the courtroom. You have to be concerned with the media. You'd like good things said about your client, but if you spend too much time on what's happening with the media and detract from your preparation to win in front of those 12 jurors, you're probably going to end up very disappointed. The cases are won inside the courtroom. Generally speaking, American juries are very honorable, very hardworking, and they take their jobs seriously and, in my opinion, are not affected by the media. Now, there are lawyers out there promoting themselves as jury shapers and media experts and all this, and I don't buy it. You want someone who knows how to try a case and focuses on trying that case, nothing else. Yes, yes, if you can get someone out there that will send your message across and try and balance some bad reporting, fine. Better to have good information about your client than bad, but don't delude yourself into thinking that wins the case. I think in the Scott Peterson trial, the defense won the battle of spin, and I think they lost the courtroom battle. You had all this fabulous reporting about how bad the prosecutors were, how great the defense was, how you had a murder case with no eyewitness, no forensics, blah, 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 and it turned out to be a very powerful circumstantial case that was one in the courtroom. Now, I was not there. I can't tell you how good or bad anybody was. All I can tell you is I saw some great press reporting on what was going to happen in that case, and you saw the results. I'd rather get skewered in the press and win the trial. Um, but I think the temptation, the lure by the media, is to think that that's where the case is being won. And it's easy for a lawyer to, get, to forget who's really most important, not the lawyer and their reputation in the media. It's the client's welfare and the verdict that's most important. I may have talked longer than I should have, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. And you mentioned the media, and of course we have a media rebuttal. Uh, Dan Abrams uh, joins us from uh, local studio in Watertown today where he taped his program tonight. As I said before, he was the face of journalism on cases like the Scott Peterson case and the Michael Jackson case, uh, a lawyer and a journalist and someone who has given critical and insightful perspectives on it. In his point of view, having watched the Jackson case very carefully and reported on it in other cases of the 20th and 21st century, please welcome Dan Abrams. Professor, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, you know, I thought I was going to be so short, I had like five minutes of things, and then Tom attacks the media, and so suddenly I've got some, something to talk about. Um, first, before I talk about the Jackson case, before I talk about media coverage of trials, etc., uh, let me say that in terms of the Michael Jackson case, um, I don't think that Tom Mesro is giving enough credit to Tom Mesro. He's talking a lot about the evidence, something about trial tactic, tactics, etc., uh, but um, Tom Mesro is, and I'm going to attack him in a moment for some of the things he just said, but he is one of the few lawyers in the country who puts his money where his mouth is. Um, he is a, a guy who doesn't just talk about pro bono work. He doesn't just talk about the community. Um, this is someone whose face should not be known for the Michael Jackson case but should be known for all of the work he does pro bono and in the communities uh, and for underprivileged defendants, et cetera. 
Um, that's why uh, Tom Mesro should be uh, the famous attorney uh, that he is, and he deserves every bit of the attention and the, um, the, the, the compliments that he gets. And that's not the case. I would not be saying that with many lawyers who'd be sitting here. I don't feel any obligation uh, to compliment Tom. Um, I will say that the, the other person who I think deserved that sort of credit, who didn't get it, who became known for something other than uh, that sort of work was Johnny Cochran, uh, who in the early 90s and late 80s was doing all sorts of work, um, wonderful work, uh, that um, I think to a certain degree became obscured uh, by his work on the O.J. Simpson case. And uh, I consider Johnny a, a very close friend. We co-hosted a show together, and um, you know, I often felt that he, d he too, uh, didn't get sometimes enough credit for the amount of work that he did for free for causes that he cared about. Um, let, me, let, me, let me speak broadly a little bit first before I talk about the Michael Jackson case and before I talk about some of the things that, that Tom w was saying. The, the question that I get asked most often is, do I think celebrities get a, a different kind of justice in this country? Put aside race for a moment. Uh, do celebrities get, uh, do, do juries tend to like celebrities and as a result treat them better? Because people say, oh, it seems that any time a celebrity's on trial, they're getting off from Robert Blake to OJ to Michael Jackson, you name it, people say, um, they seem to be walking free. And the answer that, that, I, that I give in, in response to that is that I don't really think it's as much about the jurors saying, oh, there's a celebrity and I'm not going to convict that person, as I do think that they actually evaluate the evidence more carefully than they do in an ordinary case. In an ordinary everyday murder case where there isn't uh, a great attorney representing the person, um, where they don't feel that they're being scrutinized as closely. I don't think that they really do apply um, the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. I don't think that they look at the evidence as critically as they do in high profile cases. Now I think Tom is right uh, to, to a certain degree that, that it does become something of a technicality when you say ah, beyond a reasonable doubt versus preponderance of the evidence, etc. But if you look at it from a slightly broader perspective, I think that jurors in high-profile cases do examine the evidence more closely because they know that the world is watching. Um, and I think that, that you see verdicts uh, that you might not ordinarily see in an everyday case. And depending on how you look at the system, that's either a good or bad thing. If you want to see, uh, you know, if, if you think that, uh, you know, 10 guilty people uh, should um, go free in order for, uh, to protect one innocent person, um, then, uh, then this, that's exactly what you're seeing in high-profile cases. Um, and um, it's just a depending on your perspective on, on how you look at trials. Um, with regard to, uh, to the Jackson case um, specifically, um, uh, let me talk first about, about, about the media coverage. Both the prosecution and the defense in this case spent a lot of time attacking the media. Um, you're hearing Tom talk about how horrible the media coverage was. But I will tell you as an observer that I think that Michael Jackson got a fairer shake in the media than just about any other high-profile defendant I've seen. Geraldo Rivera saying he's going to shave his mustache if Michael Jackson is convicted because this is definitely a shakedown. Um, it, you don't generally get someone with Geraldo's profile saying that he's going to shave his mustache if a particular defendant is convicted because he's that sure that the person is not guilty. Um, look, I was on the, and, and, and there is a difference, and, and, I, and I think it's important to distinguish between opinion-based programming um, and, and straight newscasts. And I've done both. I'm now doing an opinion-based program. Um, I admit it. I tell people what I'm thinking each day. I think there's something refreshing and honest about that. Tom refers to, to, those, to people who do that as sort of non-professional. I would say it's actually the most professional thing you can do, which is to come forward and say, look, 
here's, where, here's what I'm thinking. You can now take that opinion and decide for yourself what you think about how I'm perceiving the case. I think it's a lot more dangerous when people don't, don't admit how they feel about things up front. And, and, I, and there are certain people who covered this case who, were, who, who opposed Tom's view on this case who I think were dishonest about their views, who pretended to be fair and, and straight across and never have an opinion one way or the other. Oh, I'm just saying, I'm just telling you, here's what he said in court. And they're being dishonest because they're not giving you the context. Um, and I think as long as you provide context, you can offer opinion-based programming that can be professional and can be honest. And look, I started this case uh, believing that Michael Jackson would not be convicted. I said it on my program. I thought that, uh, that this was a family with too many problems, uh, that a jury just couldn't believe beyond a reasonable doubt the testimony of this family. That's how I came into the case, told my viewers that. I said, look, here's what I'm seeing so far, but let's see what we get as, as, as the case proceeds. Um, and again, I, I think that, that uh, Tom deserves a, a lot of credit for what he was able to do with the evidence. But with that said, I think that a lot of the evidence worked against uh, Tom. And what I thought by the end of the case was that the jurors wouldn't look just at the evidence in this case. I thought that they would say, the evidence that Michael Jackson had molested another boy or other boys was compelling enough that we can't let him walk out the door. That wouldn't have been the proper way to look at it. Wouldn't have been uh, applying the, the instructions that the judge gave them. But I, like Tom, also believe that you can't always assume that jurors are going to abide by each and every one of these technical instructions that they get and how to look at a case. And so by the end of the case, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get as, as detailed into it uh, um, as Tom did about the various pieces of evidence, et cetera, but I'll just tell you, by the end of the case, and, and I'll read you, because I brought a couple of the, these statements that I made about the case. Um, at the end of the case, Tom's right, I got it wrong. I said that um, um, I'm starting to question whether Michael Jackson will be able to leave this courthouse a free man. Before the case started, I predicted he would likely be acquitted or there'd be a hung jury, but now the evidence is in. I've listened to the closing arguments. I have to say, I'm leading towards just the opposite outcome, a hung jury or a conviction on at least one of the more serious charges against him. Why? because the prosecution had made out a pretty compelling case that Michael Jackson molested another child, one of the other children. And I said, regardless of the specific law, if these jurors are convinced he's a child molester, I think they'll figure out a way to convict him. The defense's closing just glossed over the allegations from other boys, merely saying that Jackson may have been naive or immature, that he may have had problems with his personal life, that they didn't specifically address those allegations. I said that that could be trouble, that Jackson says his bedroom at Neverland was just an innocent place for the kids to enjoy milk and cookies, a bedtime story. But the defense never explained why this innocent childlike man had all these porn magazines with books and naked boys in the bedroom. The prosecutors, I said, were fairly convincing when they pointed out that Jackson's only long-term relationships were with children, children who often slept in his bed, not just for a night or two, but one boy for a full year. And the tape the prosecution played, the accuser first after telling authorities about the alleged abuse, pretty powerful, I hadn't seen it before, and either that boy was reluctantly telling a difficult story about abuse or he was and has a bigger future in Hollywood than his mother thought. I said this mother has major issues when it comes to her credibility and if this came, case comes down to her, Jackson will walk, period. And that's still a possibility. But prosecutors were smart to point out that she was not the brightest bulb but still could have pulled off this massive conspiracy to bring an international celebrity down without first asking for money. I said this is the closest call I've seen yet in a high profile case, but it's a stronger case than I thought. Um, I, have, I have no problem admitting that, uh, that I was wrong um, about, about that. I did view this as a, as a very close case going to trial. Um, and I, again, think that's why the defense team deserves so much credit. But in the end, do I think this was the right verdict? Yes. 
I think that there was not enough evidence to believe that beyond a reasonable doubt that Michael Jackson molested this boy and served him alcohol with the intent to molest him. Um, the conspiracy charge was based primarily on the testimony of the boy's mother, whose credibility was simply decimated. But I don't think that it means that Jackson's been vindicated. Um, it doesn't mean that he's just the gentle, terrific guy that uh, Tom is portraying, misunderstood and targeted. I think that he spent far too many nights in beds with boys alone to believe that. Um, I think he's paid too many millions of dollars to settle claims to accept that. Uh, the stories of the boys were often too consistent. The boys looked too similar. His bedroom, um, filled with a sort of smut, a milk and cookies loving Peter Pan like figure, would either ignore or abhor. Um, and, and this is, and, and I'm, I'm reading in part from something that I said at the end uh, of the case, and that I thought that the jurors might dislike Jackson enough to convict him, but they didn't do that. Um, and uh, it doesn't mean that the the result is uh, a moral one, but it wasn't the question the jurors were asked to answer. Um, and I think on the specific question the jurors were asked to answer, uh, that they, they answered it in the only way that, that they could. Um, the, let me make a, a, a final point about, the, about media coverage of these cases. Um, I think actually in most cases, we, in, in those of us who admit that we are, and again, when, when I express an opinion, I'm not rooting for one side or another. I mean, I don't feel like I have a stake in the outcome. I don't mind when, when I, if I, if, if my reasoning is sound for offering up an opinion about what's going to happen, I don't feel ashamed to come and say, I didn't have to bring in these statements of myself admitting to you that I didn't get it right, I'm perfectly comfortable as long as I view my reasoning as sound um, and, and my, my ability to, to re relay the facts as accurate. I did that throughout this case. Um, and again, when I was reporting strictly uh, for the newscasts, for example, in the O.J. Simpson case, I was not, uh, I was not involved in an opinion-based show. I was strictly reporting what was in court. And despite the fact that we went to great lengths to be as objective as possible, and I think that in cases like the O.J. Simpson case, objectivity can actually be a bias in and of itself. We can talk about that if you have any questions later. Um, but I think that there are certain times where certain pieces of evidence, there is a right and a wrong. And as a reporter who wasn't allowed to take a position, I couldn't differentiate between the two. I had to basically say, the prosecution says this, but keep in mind the defense argues this, or the defense is saying this, but remember the prosecution argues that. And even when we would do that, of course, O.J. Simpson claimed again and again that the media coverage was unfair. The problem that O.J. Simpson had, in my opinion, was the evidence. It wasn't the way it was being reported. It was the fact that it was being reported. And, and it, is, it is such an easy scapegoat in all these cases to blame the media. Every single high-profile trial, you will hear attorneys blaming the media on both sides. Oh, so unfair. And in the Jackson case, it was almost humorous to hear both sides saying it was the media's fault. Um, and I would say, and, and in response to Tom's attack on the media, I would say the only people who I think should have less credibility than lawyers on TV are lawyers who are paid to take a position. The, the notion that somehow someone, member of the media, who, let's assume they have a bias, let's assume that they're too opinionated, that that person is less credible than someone who's being paid to advocate for someone? is an absurdity. But I love Tom Masvidal. He is, I do. I, 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 this, is, this, is, this is the response that I really, that I believe applies in response not specifically to Tom as much to attorneys who try and undermine the credibility of the media. And let me say that Tom is right. We do have different goals than the legal system. And it does create a tension. There's no doubt about it. Journalists have a different goal than the legal system, and it frustrates lawyers. 
that we can't play by the legal rules. For example, hearsay evidence. We report it all the time. Uh, lawyers would love for us to just report what comes into evidence and not report anything beyond what's in evidence because they're concerned that it's going to unfairly impact um, their client's right to a fair trial. Okay, I understand that. Um, that's generally what jury selection is for, is for smart lawyers to get up there and be able to ascertain whether prospective jurors are telling them the truth or not. But there are also instances, and, and the Supreme Court has ruled on this, and the, a lot of the number of the justices have written very interesting accounts of this, particularly I would, if you want a recommendation, I would recommend Justice Brennan's opinion in the uh, Nebraska Press Association uh, case. Um, he, he wrote a concurrence that I think really lays out why we can't do that and why we shouldn't do that. For example, uh, in a case where there's this, uh, this, this convicted uh, sex offender in Florida who has been arrested, confessed uh, to committing uh, a horrific crime on a little girl, and it turns out that it's possible that his confession will get thrown out because at one point he was asked, uh, he asked for a lawyer. He said, you know, maybe I should get a lawyer. They paused. They started questioning him again later. Can't do that. And as a result, that confession may get thrown out, and there is a chance, chance, that the charges could get dropped against him. Does the community not have a right to know that? This wasn't a coerced confession. No one's, no one's suggesting that he was sitting there um, feeling, um, uh, and you can argue that any time you mention the word lawyer that somehow it's then coerced, but as a practical matter, there's no, no argument that it was a coerced confession, and I think the community has a right to know that, to know what is really going on as opposed to the specific constraints that the legal system imposes. The reason that there are rules in, in a courtroom is because the government has the power. The government has the power to take away someone's freedom. That is an enormous power. And as a result, we try and stack the deck against them. Now, you can argue that the deck doesn't end up getting stacked against them anyway. But the reason we have a standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt basically says the government has this enormous power, and if they're going to take away someone's freedom, they better darn well be able to prove it. We don't have that power in the media. I don't buy the argument that, 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 the, that media pressure somehow leads to a particular conclusion. If that's the case, and Tom's right that the media was so awful and so horrible to Michael Jackson, these jurors are saints that they were somehow able to avoid the insidious media coverage. And any time these celebrities are found not guilty, O.J. Simpson, oh, the media coverage was all so unfair against O.J. He was found not guilty. Robert Blake was found not guilty. It just doesn't prove to be true. So I'm sure, look, I'm sure you all have probably uh, more questions than, uh, than would rather ask questions than hear me go on and on. So I will just say uh, thank you and that, uh, that I, really, I really mean what I say about uh, Tom. And Martha, I did see try a, a partial, a part of a case a long time ago. But I can't say that I know, because I also watched Tom in the Robert Blake case, where I think he was single-handedly responsible for getting some of the charges dropped against Blake in the uh, preliminary part of the case, which he's right, was televised. Um, and again, he would, I remember he came on my show at that time, and he said, well, you know, it's the evidence and this and that. It was really the lawyering. Um, and so I give him enormous credit for that. And uh, I always love having Martha on as a guest on, on my program. And uh, thank you, Professor, for inviting me. Thank you, Dan. And the, the final uh, presentation before we tell the questions comes from Martha Coakley, who not only who gives, let me also say for this record so it's clear that uh, I did invite the prosecutors in the Michael Jackson case twice, uh, and both times they refused. The second time, they adamantly refused to come to be on the panel with the Tom Mesereau. And we also invited Judge Melville, who thought about it and very much was interested in coming, but decided since there's still some uh, remaining legal issues in the case, he would not come in, but maybe coming later. But Martha Coakley has the other side. Many of the students here practicing also will be prosecutors. 
And here's where uh, race and justice also intertwine. Here is a very impressionable uh, and compelling white defendant, a foreign defendant, uh, and where the, the community, the press, loved Louise Woodward. It wasn't that she didn't do it. It was the view that she couldn't have done it. Look at her. Uh, and what challenges that place for a prosecutor to try to present your evidence when the uh, defendant in this case is someone who looks like everyone's daughter or granddaughter and where in this case while people were looking at Louise Woodward, Martha Coakley was looking at the forensic evidence and trying to prove that she did do it even if you didn't believe that she could have done it and to share some reflections on that case of uh, race and justice and in dealing with the media, please welcome Middlesex District Attorney Martha Copeland. Thanks. No, I'm like that. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. And I'm going to be really quick because I'm sort of the country cousin here and I want to leave time for questions for our visiting celebrities. Um, a couple of things just about media and then about race. Um, I uh, grew up watching a lot of Perry Mason, and I have to tell you, it's probably one of the reasons I became a trial lawyer and a prosecutor. You know, we figured we needed better prosecutors after uh, Hamilton Berger lost all those cases. I also had the opportunity in the summer I was sitting for the bar to watch Ted Bundy defend himself in Florida, and I was fascinated. I was totally hooked on court TV. That was court TV in the good old days before all the talking heads came in, but you got mostly uncensored, real trial testimony, and it was fascinating to watch. However, I will say this. As someone who's tried a lot of cases in Massachusetts with television cameras in the courtroom, Massachusetts followed Florida allowing TVs in, and that's why you see a lot of Massachusetts cases. Um, my observations are that if you're a really good trial lawyer, you forget about that. You want to make sure your jury pool has not been infected by the media, but after that, you focus on what's going on in the courtroom, and you don't pay attention to what Dan Abrams is saying about your case or anybody else, because it doesn't matter particularly true in the Woodward case, and I often, there's a great documentary about folks who have odd occupations. Uh, one of the guys who was interviewed for this documentary was a lion tamer, and when asked about how he felt about the 50,000 people in the stands when he got in with his chair, he said, you know what, I only think about the lion. And that's exactly what a good trial lawyer does. I'm sure Tom would agree that when you're in the courtroom, the lion is the judge, the lion is the jury, you don't worry about the other stuff because what those 12 people are thinking is what matters. And, and that generally proves to be true. I think jurors do look at evidence, they do look at what they hear, uh, and they try and be fair. And we've lost cases and we've won cases, and I can't think of too many that we've won that we shouldn't have. I think of some that we lost, and I know why we did. And I actually have a lot of confidence in what jurors do. They're not perfect, they're not 100%, uh, but they basically do a pretty good job most of the time. In that particular case, in the Woodward case, not only was this issue of could this 18-year-old possibly have done it? But don't forget, part of the dream team from O.J. Simpson had come to Massachusetts. Barry Sheck uh, came on board. Um, he'd just gotten that big acquittal. His biggest concern was whether jurors would hold it against him somehow in Massachusetts. He was quite disappointed to learn a lot of people didn't know who he was. Um, but he did a fabulous job in that case. But I said to him at one stage, Barry, you just don't understand the medical evidence. You don't understand the forensics. Because he's a brilliant lawyer, he's done tremendous work around DNA, and he's done a lot for people who have been wrongly convicted. We've worked with him on those cases in Massachusetts. I have a lot of respect for him. I think of him as a friend and a colleague. But he had not done a child abuse case. And the simple uh, uh, fact was that whether it was Louise Woodward or anybody else, the jurors said, we looked at the medical testimony. The baby had a cracked skull, severe bleeding, retinal hemorrhaging, and a constellation of injuries that could have only been caused by intentional inflicted injury. Um, the jurors listened to that. I'm not sure Judge Zobel did. He was busy writing up on the desk while the experts were testifying. Um, and the jurors, I think, we had a chance to meet with them afterwards, said they listened to the medical testimony. So that was comforting to hear that. A couple of comments on race. Let me just, uh, I talk a lot about high profile cases because we've had so many of them. And I, I note with some irony that it was only after what I call the couple of summers of young blonde girls who were abducted, many were found murdered, some in California, some in Massachusetts, that we had the national push for the Amber Alert. Great idea, right? Let's make sure that we respond uh, when that happens. But, but my point is this, you know, most child abuse occurs from people they know, homes they live in, friends, family. Um, it's not, you know, it's obviously horrible when someone is abducted by a stranger. 
But it was also true that it was those cute white blonde girls that got everybody's attention. And there are children all over this country who are abducted by strangers, who are mistreated by their uh, parents, family, friends, who don't have the cute faces and the blonde curls to get attention. And so we spend a lot of money on a system because that's what people want to see, and that's unfortunate. Let me make a second point. We have, and we are still investigating um, what we believe to be a murder case in this county, um, when there were three young women um, who had disappeared and whose bodies were found, now skeletons, in Hudson and in Marlboro in our county. Um, Danilia Torres, Carmen Rudy, and Betsy Montalvo had disappeared off the streets of Worcester. They were substance abusers. Many of them had turned to the street to support themselves. In one case, the family didn't even know they were missing. And as horrified as I am by those women's lives, I'm sorry, by their deaths, I'm more horrified by their lives because they fell off track. Uh, people didn't know where they were, they were missing, and we have victims like that all over this country every single day, um, and they don't get a fair shake when they're alive and sometimes when they're murdered. And the third thing I just want to mention is uh, really to respond to Tom's point, and it raises ethical issues, I think. You know, defendants who feel they will be uh, prejudiced, a jury will be prejudiced against them because of race or ethnic or some other reason, have that opportunity to play the race card. Well, what happens when the defendant decides he's going to play the race card against the victim? Different story, isn't it? Case on appeal right out of this district. A Harvard graduate student, white graduate student, who he claims uh, was attacked by a young Hispanic man while he was walking home one night from a local watering hole. Um, all the race cards were being played on this. This victim came from a tough family, had a criminal record, um, it must have been self-defense. Uh, case went to trial, emotions were high, he was convicted of manslaughter, the case is on appeal. But it actually brought up issues about what can a defendant do in attacking the victim. Um, and you know who's gonna suffer from that kind of rulings. It's gonna be poor people, it's gonna be minorities, it's gonna be African Americans, it's gonna be Hispanics. Uh, because we all have these unconscious prejudices. So as we look at these issues about social justice and race, and media coverage of this, it's important not only to look at does the defendant get a fair trial, but it's also equally important to look at does the victim get a fair trial. And that's gonna depend on you guys, next generation, to make sure that we do it fairly for both sides. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. We'll take questions now from the panel. There are two microphones back there. If you're going to get a question and have each of our panelists turn their mics on, I think Dan's is off. Is on now? Good. Yeah. Uh, and we'll take the first question uh, right here to the right. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll direct this question to uh, Tom Mesereau. Uh This is something that uh, is kind of delicate, and I can understand if you want to skirt the question. But in general terms, uh, a lawyer of your caliber would charge what kind of an hourly rate when they're not doing pro bono work? Not you personally, but you know people of, of your uh, level, let's it's, say. It really depends on the case. It, it, I, I well, a range, a range. It could be a flat fee, and not a terribly large one at that, if it's a case I want for a particular reason. Uh, it could be at a very, very high fee. If it involves, if it's someone who has the money, and it involves a lot of uh, forensic work, so it's really hard to answer the question. Uh, I can't. It, it's really goes. I mean, I've taken cases from no money to a lot of money. I just, it, it really depends on the case. Heather, this question is also directed at Mr. Mesereau. Uh While you were speaking, you really brought up um, your, I guess, very diligent defense of individuals. I really respect that, and the microphone doesn't respect me. He's going to turn it down. Okay. Can we turn it down? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. I really respect your, uh, your diligent defense of individuals, but one thing that was a little bit troubling to me was that in that defense, it seems as though, um, I guess, the overarching needs of the community may tend to suffer. You said... You, you didn't want Jesse Jackson there, you didn't want Al Sharpton there. My question is, when, when can you, if you can, strike a balance between uplifting a community in general and maintaining uh, that diligent defense of your client? 
or is that better safe for appeal? Well, well, let me ask you, the, do you mind if I ask you a question? Go ahead. Would, we, would the black community have been better off if Jesse and Al had been there and Michael had been convicted? Well, I don't, I don't pretend to speak for the black community. But you know what I'm saying. I mean, what I'm um, saying is this. I think, first of all, as I said, my primary obligation was to Michael Jackson and to no one else. I really mean that. Um, I was at a judicial conference recently at the University of Nevada in Reno with judges and media people, and some media people were really attacking me for, uh, for supporting the gag order and supporting sealing orders where pleadings were sealed. And I looked at one person, I said, with all due respect, my job is not to vindicate the First Amendment. My job is to save my client's life in the case. And I really believe that was my primary obligation here. Uh, but as I said before, there have been cases where the client and the lawyer got together and decided that the primary obligation of both of them was to make a political statement, make a moral statement, a social statement, and they wanted to make sure that was done. And Mr. Kunstler, who I mentioned before, was someone who did that quite often. <coughs> Mr. Darrow, who I mentioned before, did that quite often. It was sometimes attacked for taking cases and trying to present a social issue far broader than the future and freedom of his client. So there is a struggle there in terms of values. I think you have to work that out with the client. Um, but I really believe in the cases that I mentioned, well, not the first case, of course, I felt that I absolutely had to go all out to raise a racial issue and expose what the prosecution was doing in the case and the FBI was doing in the case and their racist statements and their racist motives and the fact that they would never do this in any other white community, how they targeted this black community for four years, went into churches, went in everywhere and were recording people. Um, uh, there was some other evidence also. There was one white city council member who they just sort of brushed off very quickly and, and didn't really just keep after her like they did the black members of the council. But in the other two cases, first of all, I did not think there was really a racial issue to raise in the Michael Jackson case. I said that before. Uh, in the Larry Carroll case, there most certainly was. They went after three black men and let all the white men get a pass. Uh, but I still thought that the best way to acquit my client was not raising it. And frankly, when I mentioned my reasons to black activists in Los Angeles, they all said, fine, you know, win the case. We want you to win the case. We want him vindicated. And by the way, you know, after that, uh, when asked, I was not hesitant to say, you know, how come the white guys who actually put these fraud scams together were never touched, and the three black men who were sucked in and told they would get commissions and one of whom, my client, even invested himself in it, thinking it was legitimate. How come they go after them tooth and nail? Um, I don't know if I've answered your question. It's a value judgment. It's a, it's a, it's a compromise of something. Uh, and you have to decide what your primary obligation is as a defense lawyer. Let me ask Martha and Dan to make a quick, brief comment on that, because there's also the, the role of the media and prosecutors in both the Peterson case and the Jackson case. Gloria Allred, for example, was very on the news every night, uh, there for victims. A great story for media, but the question is whether or not uh, an important aspect of the government's case. Your sense about whether or not a victim's advocate is someone you want sitting next to you or attending a press conference or playing a role in your case, Martha, as a prosecutor. And Dan, is there an appeal to the media whether or not either side likes it to get people like that, like Gloria, who are very uh, well-known, controversial, but uh, who would generate some interesting debate. Martha? Well, I, I still think that, you know, we, we, do a, we do this case by case. We do cases by facts, not because the victim advocates are out because there's a victim or all the defense lawyers are out because this person is black or purple. Or, and, and so that's important that we do it that way. Whenever other issues come in, the rhetoric rises and we lose sight of what we're trying to do is figure, in this case, did the person do what we said they did? And, and that's where all the other stuff comes in. Now, it happens in a trial, child abuse cases are particularly difficult. You know, the people bring a lot of baggage about child abuse and who does it, who doesn't, and where's the forensics, the CSI factor, all of that stuff. Um, but, you know, as a prosecutor, we, you know, we're prohibited from commenting, especially during a trial. We don't, we don't really want anybody else doing it. And keep in mind, you know, presumably your jury is sequestered. Whatever else is going on while the trial's going on, your jury isn't and shouldn't be seeing that. The rest of the world does, so be it. Um, I love victims' rights advocates because uh, a trial, and this again goes to the difference between what, what, what we're doing, which I view as actually trying to assess the totality of the circumstances and the truth versus 
what I view as sometimes legal fictions in, inside courtrooms. A, a criminal trial is between the state and a defendant. Um, and I think that rightly so, inside the courtroom, um, we limit the amount of say a victim can have. I have no problem with having that victim's advocate have their say in terms of the court of public perception. Um, I mean, it, so the, the honest, I mean, wh whether it's one person or another person, it depends. But I also like the fact that we can be honest about saying this is what this person does. And there's no ambiguity. You know, sometimes I get concerned when we say a former prosecutor or a criminal defense attorney. I, I, I like to know, I like the viewer to know where the person's coming from. Uh, to me, that, that adds a level of intellectual honesty to the presentation. Okay. Question to the right and then to the left. Um, thank goodness for people's skepticism of the media. I hope you keep doing your job because you create more skepticism um, the way you're doing your job. And um, what I want to find is that since the prosecution heaped so many charges up on Jackson, the, the fact that it wasn't sequestered, didn't you think that that like stacked the deck against you? And do you think that putting all those charges on Jackson guaranteed the prosecution would get at least one conviction? Which well, Mr. Abrams kept saying at the end of the trial, I thought he was going to get convicted of one charge, at least one charge. Yeah. Well, I first, I of, first of all... Uh, and also, uh, the, the prior victim or alleged victim, the original victim, why didn't you try to force him to get on the stand and to break him down? Or could that have been done? <laughs> Well, first of all, um, as I said before, I had great faith in the jury. Uh, it was more of an intuitive feeling than anything else. I didn't want them sequestered. I think a sequestered jury is an unhappy jury, is an uncomfortable jury, and I always fear that that will hurt the defense. Um, I also felt that they were a very stubbornly individualistic and very honorable group who would listen to the judge's instructions and avoid the media. And indeed, since the trial, they have all said that. They didn't know certain things were being said out there. They didn't made a very, very strong effort not to watch TV, not to read the papers. Uh, so I put my trust in them in that regard. Uh, as far as loading up on charges, I think it clearly was a prosecutorial tactic where they really only wanted him convicted on one to get what they, what they wanted. Uh, I always felt the conspiracy charge was bogus from day one, and we used it. To help, our, to help our side out. They had a conspiracy charge that Michael Jackson had organized a conspiracy to abduct children, falsely imprison a family, uh, and to commit extortion. And I think the more the jury learned what kind of a person he is, the more absurd those charges became. I think the prosecution did it for a lot of reasons, some of them tactical and some of them strategic. I think, as I said before, they were hoping that if they just used these charges to dirty Jackson up any way possible, something would fall out in their favor. And they also, in my opinion, were trying to use the conspiracy charge to get in hearsay evidence that normally would not be admitted. There is an exception to the uh, prohibition on hearsay, and that's called co-conspirator hearsay. And what this allowed the mother to do was come in and say, all these people said A, B, C, D, and E, um, uh, whereas she normally would not be allowed to say that because it would be hearsay, because there was an exception if there's a conspiracy charge. They also did it to scare these alleged conspirators away so they wouldn't cooperate with the defense and come in to exonerate Michael Jackson. But I think in the process of pursuing what I think was a very disingenuous allegation, they undercut their own credibility because along with the charges looking absurd and the evidence looking just absurd, there was a timing problem because, as we pointed out, uh, they tried to claim that Michael Jackson formed a conspiracy because this Bashir documentary had aired, which was very unflattering. He had then formed a conspiracy to force this family to make statements that exonerated him and then disappear to Brazil. And the molestation is supposed to start in the middle of all of this. And it just didn't make any sense. And I think they really hurt themselves by bringing these crazy charges because it also allowed me to just point out, you can't believe what they're saying or doing. You know, they will just almost say anything to dirty up Michael Jackson. Next question. Pardon me? Oh, first case. Okay. You know, they, uh, this is interesting because um, 
Anyone who followed the case knew about the issue of 1108 evidence, which in California is called prior bad acts evidence. And what, the process, what California allows, and few states do allow, is that in a case like this, you can bring in evidence of other alleged similar acts, even if they were never charged with a crime, and even if they're not the essence of the charge in this particular case. So what they said in their opening statement was, we have evidence that five young men were molested and we're going to present all of that to you. And to make it even worse, it appeared, the judge did something I've never seen happen in a case like this. With respect to three of those alleged five victims, he allowed witnesses to come in and say they saw them molested without the prosecution having to bring the actual alleged victims in. Okay? So they did that. They put on three guards who had worked at Neverland to say they saw these three people molested. One of them, Macaulay Culkin, okay, the actor, all right? Now, those three guards had sued Michael Jackson, claiming that he wrongfully terminated them. He had cross-complained, saying that they had stolen property from him. It was the longest civil trial in the history of Santa Maria. They lost their case. Jackson won his cross-complaint. He had a million-dollar judgment against all of them. There were judicial findings of fraud against all of them. They had gone to the tabloids and sold stories, and the three people they say they saw molested, they were my first three witnesses. They came in and said they were never touched. So when that happens, I think we were able to effectively take all of us and say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you can't believe these prosecutors. You can't believe their case. You know, they'll, they'll say anything to try and win. Now, the one you're talking about never showed up. He's the one who got a settlement in the early 90s. Now, my understanding is the prosecutors tried to get him to show up, and he wouldn't. If he had, I had witnesses who were going to come in and say he told them it never happened, and that he would never talk to his parents again for what they made him say, and it turned out he had gone into court and gotten legal emancipation from his parents. His mother testified that she hadn't talked to him in 11 years. So, you know, there was a problem there as well. There was a fifth alleged victim who testified who said that Michael Jackson had been playing with him and had gone too far and touched his testicles, and he needed five years of therapy after it. And during the first therapy session, the DA was present. And he also admitted he wanted money from him, and his mother wanted money from Jackson, and his mother went to a tabloid and sold the story as well. So you put all that together, and I submit that it helped us. Next question. <clears throat> We've got about four more minutes. Yep. With all due respect, I think that the trial of the century was neither O.J. or Michael, but the trial of the century happened in the early 90s in Memphis, Tennessee, where it was found that uh, Martin Luther King's murder was a conspiracy, and I think his family was awarded $20 or something like that. Uh, my two quick questions are, uh, do, you, do you believe that there are other external political factors in the Michael Jackson trial as far as his ownership of the Beatles catalog and uh, some of his Elvis Presley songs. And my second question deals with a, uh, a trial going on right now in the so-called Middle East dealing with Saddam Hussein. Do you think that it would be a proper uh, legal maneuver to have Mr. Hussein uh, given amnesty for his crimes that he's charged with, just like the racist white supremacists in South Africa were given amnesty through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Where they, went, where they were uh, uh, admitted of their crimes and were uh, let off scot-free. Two questions. One is the first one is about whether or not... Um, I'll take this. I think it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whether or not Michael well, Jackson's ownership of the Beatles... Uh, uh, and let, the, let me say this. Does that influence the case of whether sure. or not Saddam should be given amnesty? Well, uh, I, I can talk authoritatively about the first issue. The second one, I'm, I'm not an international lawyer, and I frankly don't know a lot of the details, except I have trouble believing anybody's going to give Saddam Hussein amnesty, but nevertheless. First question, Michael Jackson has been the greatest target for civil lawsuits I've ever, ever experienced. He's literally been sued thousands of times by people he hasn't met, people he knows nothing about, and yes, there are people who would like to obtain his property, including his interest in the Beatles catalog, and their desire to obtain his assets would have been significantly enhanced if he had been convicted. Uh, he would have been disabled from defending cases. 
If he defended them, he would be walking into court a convicted felon and child molester or conspirator, whatever the conviction might have been. And I happen to fervently believe there were people who were waiting in the winds, hoping he would be convicted so they would simply walk in and grab assets. Um, can I tell you definitively that people who want the catalog uh, are in that group? Uh, no, I can't. Uh, all I can tell you is that he would have been substantially disabled from defending himself in any of these situations if he had been convicted uh, and was in prison. Any comments on amnesty for Saddam Hussein? I mean, you know, I, I, I'm assuming your question is rhetorical. You don't, you're, not act, you're actually asking more about South Africa than about Iraq. And no, he's asking seriously about Saddam Hussein. Seriously. Okay, seriously, there's no chance Saddam's getting amnesty. Why not? Um, why not? Because there's no reason to give Saddam amnesty, first of all. And if you're going to ask it as a comparative question, then it's a political question. It's not a legal question. It's a question of race. But, but you have, you've had it, Europeans in South Africa yeah, that's for fine. centuries who have that, that's committed political, atrocities against I'm, people. I'm not going to. Now Saddam I'm, there's no way I'm allegedly did the same thing. Okay, you ask your no way I'm going to. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to argue one bit with you on any of the statements you're making. But those are political statements. Next question. I've noticed that there is an interesting choice of language among the three of you in that, you know, you have a defense attorney calling or using the term accuser and a prosecutor using the term victim. When in court or in the media do you think it's appropriate to use either term or neither term, like alleged victim or something else? Are you a 1L? Uh, I'm actually a freshman undergraduate. Oh, okay. I, okay. <laughs> Most of the time in court, we, we, we will get a routine motion from defense counsel, and we cannot use victim. We can say alleged victim, uh, and certainly the newspapers do that, and, and we do that, because people are innocent until proven guilty, and so a victim, although there are some, you know, sometimes it's not, someone is a victim, it may just be a question of who did it, but it's, even so in court, we don't use uh, victim without um, an adjective in and front You know of what's it. very interesting in terms of uh, reflecting the media's perception on the Michael Jackson case is, I heard more people refer to this boy as the accuser than I have in almost any other case. Mm. In almost every other case, it seems that the media is bending over backwards to call the person the alleged victim, which suggests a level of, um, a level of truth in the allegation, even if you call it alleged. In this case, and again, this, is my, this further, I think, supports the point I was making before, which is, that Michael Jackson got as fair a shake from the media as I've seen any high-profile defendant get, is that the boy was constantly referred to as the accuser in this case more than I've seen in any other case. Ju? Um, first of all, thank you for coming tonight. It's been really enlightening to hear your comments. Producing for cable TV, I actually found your comments quite interesting on how a lot of people attack the media, even though I'm glad that the media fosters the truth and giving the truth to the public. But my question is posed to the two lawyers in the room. And my question for you is, having had all the experience and knowledge that you have practicing for this long period that you have, what, would your, what is one thing that you wish you had learned while you were in law school that you know now? Mm. You're older than me, Tom. <laughs> you can take that part. You. you know, I wish I had emphasized trial practice more. I think it's not right that people graduate from medical school and they can't operate on, in a life or death situation without real hands-on training, yet people get out of law school and people's lives are in their hands and they don't know the first thing about trying a case. I think um, that's wrong. Um, I think there are too many guinea pigs out there for lawyers who just don't know what they're doing in the trial courts because someone can go to prison for the rest of their life, someone can be executed, someone can lose all their assets, which can destroy their family uh, because a lawyer is not skilled, is not experienced, um, and we just don't require that to, uh, as, a, as a ticket for trying cases. So I think, uh, I think the legal profession needs to realize that trying cases is no different than a doctor operating. Any quick comments from Mark? Yeah, the, it, and the corollary to that is on the public side, people have to pay for it because we don't want to pay our prosecutors, we don't want to pay our defense counsel, and then we wonder why we have mistakes and wrongful convictions. And it's, the, the medical analogy is apt because if we underfunded our medical health system the way we do our criminal justice system, you would, you know, you'd have a lot of autopsies uh, with people who died because people weren't skilled. 
However, the one thing that is true is, there, and Tom would agree with me, I think, there's just no substitute for experience. You could be in law school for six years, but if you're not putting juries in the box, doing that witness, getting feedback from people, and that's why watching yourself do stuff is helpful, but getting feedback, there, you just, you can't do it unless you, unless you do it. I'm going to take all three of the last questions at once and then get one answer. So why don't you all come up to the well, microphone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, a little closer. Excuse me. Thank you for coming, Mr. Mesereau. But I'm going to articulate what you first started when you first started speaking about racism being applied to individuals around the board in America. And I'm going to take you back in this state right here in 1738, a case by the name of Massachusetts Bay Colony versus Henry Negro James, Bodies and Strangers, it's Bodies and Strangers, in plain view. Do you remember that case when you was a student here? Because I've never been in law school in my life and I know the case almost in its entirety and every time I ask for a copy in this state, no one's heard of the case. No one's heard of that case. But I found that case in the law library at MCI Walpole back in 1979 and I left it with some individuals there and I haven't been able to find them because I can shepherdize any case that I've seen in front of me and I don't have any legal practice. And I just cannot find that case. And my second question is, I can't understand why that when in Massachusetts, the trial attorneys, and I've had this conversation with Mr. Stephen Sack, who was a very renowned attorney here, and um, we speak briefly a lot on different cases. And there are a lot of cases in this, in this state where attorneys are very quick to plea bargain, especially when they have all the information that can lead them to more than just the gist of why an individual is being tried, they would not even want to try the case, and she almost spoke about it a little while ago. But the, the attorneys in this state here, I don't even want an attorney if it's not Stephen Sack or Mr. Uh, Max, uh, Mr. Uh, Maxwell Stern, because those are the two individuals I have any faith in. And it's really sad that the Jewish prudence in this state here is like it don't even exist for an individual to get a a, a, a fair trial because I believe there's no such thing as justice because the Constitution relegates that when it speaks about it and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri and I do know about the case of United States uh, versus uh, Mr. Um, um, Monroe. I can't I think it's I can't remember the citation right now but I, it'll come back to me a little while right but the individual was a slave individual and he was and his ownership was transferred Dred Scott versus Dred Stanford. Scott yeah and Missouri. I, I can remember cases like that which transcends anything Michael Jackson would ever want to be a witness to or a victim to. Okay, now Mr. Jones and Mr. Cook, last question. So the one's about 1738 Mass Bay Colony, and I've got three people who are going to research that and get the answer. Good. Right? And laptops. They'll find it. Mr. Jones and Mr. You Cook. Know, I'd like to kind of attach to what my brother was saying. In a sense, I'm one of the students who was under the tutelage of Professor Ogletree in the Criminal Justice Institute, but one of the issues that comes up for me listening here and, and every day at CJI is, is how do you arrive at your version of the truth? Did there come a time when you sat across the table from Michael Jackson and said, Mike, did you do it? Um, or did you look at the evidence in, in whole and come to a conclusion there? Which is, I, I mean, I'm not making a normative judgment either way, but it's a, it's a, it's a question also across the other side of the table at the prosecution because it, as, as I watch at Roxbury, everything is so rushed, everything is so hurried, and the system's just chugging right along. How do you, as a prosecutor, arrive at the truth? Do you, do you ask the victim broader questions besides what specifically happened at this moment, or do you really try to get a bigger picture and try to do justice with a broader sense of truth? Okay, so. Mr. Cook. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mesereau. Uh, and Dan and uh, Ms. Coakley, uh, I uh, wanted to uh, make a, uh, ask a question of uh, Mr. Mesereau and, and I also wanted to ask a question of uh, Mr. Abrams. Uh, and uh, in the case of uh, Michael Jackson, we, we realized that um, cameras were not allowed in the courtroom um, in general. Uh, I'd like to know what your disposition is uh, toward uh, having a trial, especially high-profile trials of this nature, uh, what your position 
or perspective is on um, cameras in the courtroom. Um, the uh, comments that you've made about the Michael Jackson case in respect to race are interesting, and I think that you have uh, provided an apt uh, and uh, sophisticated uh, perspective on how you handled the racial issues from that vantage point. But um, one of the concerns that I think a lot of black people have had, uh, and certainly the thoughts that I've had uh, in looking at the Michael Jackson phenomenon is that Michael Jackson is an eccentric type of person or he has characteristics or behavioral uh, aspects of his personality that are apparently uh, considered eccentric. And it seems to me that um, the media uh, has highlighted those supposed eccentricities uh, and uh, made him look like a buffoon and a fool. And uh, to me, there is a racial element there because I think Michael Jackson is one of the very few uh, black, high profile black people that we've grown up with who is more or less an artistic eccentric. But on the other hand, there are many wealthy, artistic white people uh, that are well known who are also eccentrics. And, and so I'd like you to um, comment a little bit about that aspect of it. Uh, I think the media has exploited this and I think there is a racial element in the sense that uh, uh, his eccentricities are no more bizarre than that of many other white artistic personalities. Uh, Mr. Abrams, you have uh, in your defense of the criticisms of Mr. Mesro of the performance of the media in the Michael Jackson case uh, have, uh, you know, sort of suggested that it was more balanced there than uh, there was. And you pointed out that Geraldo Rivera, as an example, uh, shows some balance. But I would really ask you if you could cite three or four other personalities that were out there in this case that uh, appeared to defend the defense side of the case. And, and, and that's finally, balance, right? And, Just so we're clear, and, balance and, from your perspective I'm is talking about defending balance, the defense balance case. in terms of, of, of the... Uh, is advocating Michael Jackson's position. Or, or yeah. And, right. okay. and, and, secondly, right. and secondly, in your personal opinion, did you, were you unaware of information that would have had a more exculpatory, exculpatory impact in Michael's benefit and uh, some of the points that Mr. Mesro mentioned about that. Your I would like question? some comments yeah. on those things. Final question, then we're going to get one answer. <laughs> I've got the five points. Here's the last one. Okay, um, actually, I just want to say that I'm not a law student. I'm just representing the Michael Jackson fan community online. And um, I was going to add to what he said about uh, the race card being played. I think that we were really blessed to have uh, the jury on our side. And um, I think even if you wanted to, you couldn't have played. I mean, if you did find that there was a component of race, I don't know how effective it would have been for you to uh, actually go out and say that. Because like he was saying, the media has propagated this image that Michael Jackson is not an African-American or he's disowned his race. And they've, you know, just changed this whole vitiligo into this, you know, skin bleaching thing. So even if you had gone out and said that there is a component of race, it, I don't think it would have been effective. Um, because most people just, you know, look at him and they say, oh, he's a white guy. He doesn't, you know, own his race. So that's something I want you to react to. And um, okay, we're going to have to stop there. We've got just a couple minutes for responses. The first question was about plea bargaining, whether or not it's good for the system. The other, the search for the truth from the prosecutor and the defense point of view, cameras in the courtroom, and then the issue of race in the Michael Jackson case. Martha, which one of those do you like to take? Um, I'll take search for the truth for the victim. I, my, my practice has been I need to believe the victim myself, and I need to feel at least reasonably certain that we can prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. We've had tons of victims, particularly kids, sometimes young women, sometimes young men who've been sexually assaulted. 
I believe them, but a jury isn't because there's not enough evidence or they were intoxicated or there, there's contradictory evidence out there and it's just not gonna work. So I be, I'm realistic about before I put people through a trial, what the odds are, and I'm not gonna put a six year old or seven year old through a trial if I don't think there's a reasonable chance that there, there will be success there, it's not fair. Um, there are cases where we just have a victim's testimony and we, do, we go with that. But if you don't believe the victim, if you as a prosecutor do not believe the victim, nobody else is going to, and you need to know that. Um, and it's important for me, defense has a different job. Defense is to make sure we do our job. Our job is to make sure that we bring charges that we believe in and prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's different in other what a defense lawyer does, I believe. So I think we have a different and a higher obligation not to bring cases that we don't believe the victims are telling the truth um, and, and we can prove it. Now we don't, I, I will, say that we don't always know that. I mean, sometimes you say, I believe the victim, but I don't know, but then I'm not the truth finder, and that's why we have an adversarial system. But my, pra my experience has been, if I have doubts about the victim, the jury or the judge is gonna too, so. Dan, you can pick your piece. Cameras yeah. in the courtroom, uh, Rachel Michael Jackson. I'll just quick, cameras in the courtroom, you know, cons the, con the concern about bias in the media, to me the answer is put a camera in there. If you wanna watch it, the whole trial, you can watch it, uh, you don't have to, rely on me if you don't trust me or whoever else. Um, I think that's the strongest argument for a camera in the courtroom. I think it was a good question you asked actually about Michael Jackson and his appearance and is he, I do think that there's too much focus on his appearance um, in, in the media, but I don't think that the reason is because of race. I would argue that the reason is because he has changed before the eyes of the public. Um, and as a result, I think he's getting a harder time than another person might because people are seeing him, have seen how much different he looks. And again, whether it's based on disease or makeup or whatever the case may be, I think that's why he's getting teased, so to speak. And I think there's no other way to, to say it honestly than uh, someone else uh, might. And in response to the question about, you know, do I think that people were being uh, fair to Michael Jackson? Again, you know, you're talking to someone who came into this very dubious of this family, and I remain dubious of this family. I think that's exactly the kind of person that you want. Um, I'm skeptical in general. Um, I was skeptical of the story that this family was telling. I think what Tom said about the conspiracy charge was right on. Um, it didn't make sense. I'd say it again and again. It doesn't make sense. Um, I think that's fair. And, and, you know, look, if you, have a, if you think Michael Jackson's absolutely 100% innocent and that ev if, ev if you accept everything Tom has said, that these were simply invented charges by a vindictive prosecutor and that's your position, then you're not going to think that I was being objective. But I think that if you view it from a more balanced perspective, which is that these prosecutors came into it um, thinking that, uh, and a grand jury found that there was enough evidence to send Michael Jackson to trial, but in the end, that's what a trial's for, and that the system worked in this case. I think it's a pretty balanced perspective uh, on the case. Tom? You know, let me start with the issue of race. <clears throat> uh, I recently addressed the annual convention of the National Bar Association in Los Angeles, and <clears throat> if, if any of you don't know what the National Bar Association is, that, that's an organization of lawyers that was formed in the 1920s when black lawyers could not get into the American Bar Association. They had a strict prohibition. Blacks were not allowed to join. And black lawyers formed the National Bar Association in response to that prohibition. Um, and I gave my views on race in the Michael Jackson case. A law professor from Florida uh, asked me a few questions. He had just said published a book about race and the law, which I want to read as soon as I can. And, and, and he sort of was skeptical that did I really understand the deeper implications of race in this case. And I, I, I answered him this way. I said, look, I am convinced that the prosecutors were very, very attracted to the idea of convicting the world's greatest celebrity. I'm convinced they were far more attracted to that than destroying a black person. Okay, these are three white prosecutors, okay? Um, however, racism can exist on an unconscious or a subconscious level as well as a conscious level. And I said the following, I said, you know, you've got me thinking about this. Uh, I'm still convinced I'm correct that it was the celebrity part that was most attractive to them. It was the celebrity part that was gonna get them 
significant advantages as the prosecutors who took down Michael Jackson, the world's greatest known entertainer. However, did the fact that Michael Jackson is black, that he is from a prominent black family, that he has black security people around him, factor into their feelings or belief, be it conscious or unconscious, that this would somehow help them disconnect him from this jury and this community and make him less valuable and easier to convict? Maybe. Maybe. I just don't think it was the primary motive. I just don't. Um, but, you know, the fact that uh, he was clearly going to arrive at court surrounded by black people, he was going to have black people in the courtroom, his family primarily supporting him, and the fact that you were not likely to get any blacks on the jury. In fact, there were three, two black women were possible jurors. They removed the two of them. I did raise a constitutional objection, which was denied. Um, did that play a part in their effort to figure out how convictable he was, how we could degrade and devalue him in the courtroom in some level? I think it could have. Uh, because this was a very mean-spirited prosecution. They attacked everything about him, his sexuality, his finances, his music, his attire. They were willing to do anything. And I've got to tell you, I heard Dan, uh, who is, is, you know, who, whose show I appeared on after the, after the verdicts, and I appeared on not very many of them, but I did appear on his because he's always been very professional and honorable with me. But I heard him mention this idea of pornography. Well, he's correct. They found approximately 90 girly magazines in Michael Jackson's home. Playboy, Hustler, Penthouse. His fingerprints were on them. He had bought them. They never found any kiddie porn on computers or anywhere else. And I used that fact in my closing argument to explain why this guy is not a pedophile. So a lot of things that the media picked up and gave you a surface impression about were not at all what they were made to see. Well, thank all of our presenters, Martha Coakley, Dan Abrams, and Tom Nesro. Thank you for coming. Have a great evening.